Well, good evening and welcome to CAF Warbird Tube, the show where we talk about warbirds, history, World War II flying, and much, much more. And this show is supported by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. This nonprofit membership organization has preserved and flown historic aircraft for more than 65 years. CAF's mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flights and living history experiences. And you can uh, join the organization as a uh, donor or by uh, becoming a member of the uh, CAF and also by volunteering your time and talents. For more information about the uh, Commemorative Air Force, please visit our webpage, commemorativeairforce.org. I'm your host, Steve Buss, and welcome to everyone watching tonight. If you're watching on Facebook, uh, welcome. Those of you on YouTube and those of you watching on GoToMeeting, glad to have you along. If you would do us a favor, please just take a second to hit that like, share, and subscribe or follow us button, and you'll be updated on all the uh, programs we have coming up. On this episode, we're going to take a look back at 80 years, uh, an 80 year anniversary of one of the uh, pivotal moments of World War II, the famous Doolittle Raid on Japan. But tonight, we're going to take a look from the Navy perspective. And if you have any questions for our guests, just put them in the chat or comment box and we'll do our best to uh, address them. So joining us right now from the USS Hornet Sea, Air and Space Museum in Alameda, California, is uh, Chuck Myers and Russell Moore. Gentlemen, good evening and uh, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having us. Yep, thanks for having us. Well, uh, Chuck, let's let's start with you. Just tell us a little bit about uh, your background and and uh, what do you do at the uh, museum? Well, I hope the FBI isn't listening, but I'll give you a <laughs> thumbnail sketch and see what happened. Um, I, I joined the Navy after graduating from college. I went to uh, Navy, uh, Navy Officers Candidate School and uh, I graduated from that for reasons I still can't explain. I uh, told them at the, uh, when they requested uh, what I would like to do after uh, graduation and commissioning, I said, well, I'd like to have a large combatant on the West Coast and I'd like to go to U.S. Naval Justice School. It's that latter part that I, I can't explain to anybody. Why did you ask for Justice School? Well, it was available and it was in Newport, so why not? Anyway, uh, uh, I was commissioned. I got sent off to uh, Justice School, which was six weeks of evidence, substantive law and procedure. And then they said, go forth and be a Navy lawyer. And they sent me out to the USS Yorktown in Long Beach. And and I spent my time there uh, as a legal officer. Uh, fortunately for me, I also got a chance to uh, uh, stand watches on the bridge. And so I tell people who take tours on the Hornet with me that at age 23 and the captain uh, asleep in his sea cabin, I had the opportunity to manage uh, uh, an aircraft carrier all on my own. And depending on where we were, I also got to tell eight destroyers what to do at the same time. So that's why my head is so big is because of that experience. So that's, that's sort of a thumbnail sketch of that. In civilian life, uh, I worked for 26 years for the infamous telephone company. Uh, then I spent about eight years uh, living and working in Europe, uh, doing telecommunications consulting, came back to the US. Uh, and at some point in time, my older son asked me, um, after I'd been back in Alameda for a while, Dad, didn't you serve on the Yorktown? And isn't the Yorktown just like the Hornet? Uh, yeah, what's your point? Well, why aren't you interested in the Hornet? And so I didn't have an excuse. So the next day when they were open, I went over and uh, said, you know, I served on one of these things. Uh, you got anything that would be interesting? And that was about almost 13 years ago now. So uh, it's been a real hoot for me uh, since I since my older son pointed me in the right direction. Good. And and Russ, uh, how about you? Sure. My uh, story is not quite as interesting as Chuck's, but uh, I was in the corporate world for a long time and looking for a change and have always been really interested in history. Um, and so the, the Hornet uh, came calling. I saw a job opportunity there as a community event manager. So I switched over. I've been there for about two and a half years now. Uh, I'm a, sort of an amateur author. I have a couple of articles that have been uh, published in World War II magazines. And so for me, sort of working at the Hornet is kind of a dream come true because I get to work with guys like Chuck and I get to really learn uh, even more uh, than I thought. I thought I knew a lot. <laughs> and then uh, being on the ship for a couple of years, I realized there's so much more to learn. So yeah, now I switched. I do a little bit more of the marketing and outreach side, um, but uh, yeah, still spend a lot of my time on the ship. So great place to work, a lot of fun. Yeah, now it, for those of you who don't realize what they're talking about, this is the actual uh, 
aircraft carrier. It's actually the, the second iteration of, of the uh, Hornet from World War II, but uh, it's docked there, and, and you actually uh, work on an aircraft carrier. That's, that's exactly. correct. That's too, right. <clears throat> well, let's uh, let's take a look back uh, 80 years. We just uh, celebrated the uh, 80th anniversary of the uh, Doolittle Raid, but uh, as I said in the introduction, we're going to take a look at this uh, from uh, more of a Navy perspective. A few weeks ago, we were very honored to have uh, uh, Jonna Doolittle hops uh, with us, and she talked about uh, you know her grandfather and and the Raiders and things like that. But then, well, I started wondering about the uh, the other side. I mean, the Navy was more than uh, than just the uh, taxi service for uh, for uh, the yes. B-25s and the Doolittle raid. But let's let's take us take us back to where it all really started, and that is uh, the, the attack on Pearl Harbor, which uh, was uh, really the uh, brought obviously brought the United States into the war, but also uh, became the impetus for this first strike back at uh, the Japanese homeland. Uh, the, yeah, the slide that you're seeing on there uh, had a, uh, some interesting aspects to it, but uh, Pearl Harbor changed the uh, United States from essentially a, a, a isolationist nation into one that was, uh, you know, really, uh, really interested in, in getting back at the Japanese who attacked us. And then interestingly enough, Four days later, the uh, Hitler decided, for reasons that are almost unexplainable, that, that he wanted to declare war on the United States, and so uh, there became a, an issue of, you know, what should come first, the Japanese who attacked us or the Germans who declared war on us. And by uh, common agreement among our, ourselves and the British, uh, the, the, the war in Europe was much more pressing than the war in the Pacific, and so a lot more resources were dedicated to uh, the, the war in Europe than were to the Pacific. Nonetheless, um, Roosevelt um, himself wanted to get back at the Japanese for uh, that, the, the, the day of infamy, if you will. And so uh, shortly after Pearl Harbor, uh, he asked that we do something uh, to uh, strike back at the Japanese for their sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. And so that's um, that's how we, entered World War II going from an isolationist nation into one that was really prepared for war in a, in a few months and, and really um, exceeded all expectations of everybody, particularly the Japanese, about what our capabilities were. That's very true. And, uh, you know, I guess one of the, the, the uh, crossroads in history is it, just the, what you noted there is that uh, it's on the slide that, that Hitler was not pleased that the Japanese had launched that attack because he really wanted to dispatch with the British before he had to take on the uh, United States. But uh, the attack also put him in a, a rather difficult position. And uh, really, it, can you imagine what would have happened if the Japanese hadn't uh, attacked and uh, England had fallen? It's so, well, uh, so interesting to look at the different aspects of history, how things cross. He would have been a lot more upset if he had known that the Japanese ambassador to Berlin was a chatty Cassian, that the United States had broken the Japanese diplomatic code at that point in time, not their naval code, but their diplomatic code. So we could read ev almost everything that the Japanese ambassador sent back to uh, Tokyo from Berlin. And so that was a great advantage for the Allies during, that, during the uh, European War. I've forgotten his name. He was a baron and a, and a general in the army. Um, wrote, wrote no i should i should stop because i can't remember his name now. Okay. and of course uh one of the uh one of the the tenants of uh the japanese were uh, that the uh, divine wind would protect them from any invading force and uh that I, i'm sure that weighed on roosevelt as well uh to, to prove them wrong as quickly as as we could yeah, it's interesting. Uh, the Japanese islands, in fact, had never been invaded, nor had any bombing ever occurred. And, uh, you know, it's interesting on this slide is uh, uh, I point out the fact that uh, on December 21st, there was a meeting of the Joint Chiefs and uh, conventional wisdom says that there was a, uh, that at that meeting, the idea of bombing Japan had taken place. But if you read the minutes of that meeting, nothing like that has ever uh, is ever proposed in the in the minutes of the meeting, so it may have happened, but it wasn't recorded anywhere. And so, you know, conventional wisdom in this case may may not be correct, because uh, it just it's just not in the minutes. So we don't know what really happened at that point in time. But the idea of attacking Japan and and uh, you know getting back at the at the uh, 
sneak attack on Pearl Harbor was definitely in the minds of the, of the leadership of, of the U.S., including Roosevelt and everybody on down. Uh, this is a slide that points out that uh, Ernest King was commander-in-chief of, uh, of the U.S. fleet and chief of naval operations, a combined thing. Uh, so he was for, uh, definitely the, the top dog in the Navy at the time. And, uh, you know, a, a really interesting character in and of himself. And we could probably spend an hour talking about Ernest King and, and his proclivities and, and so on and so forth. It's said that even his, his daughters didn't like him, but, uh, you know, he was, he was without doubt uh, central to the, to the uh, pursuing the war in the Pacific without, without any question. He served 55 years in the Navy, which is still the longest stretch anybody has ever served, but definitely did not suffer fools gladly. And uh, as the slide says, probably didn't suffer fools at all. <clears throat> and of course, his uh, counterpart, uh, the Army Air Corps, Hap Arnold, Cap Arnold was uh, was an interesting character in and of himself. Uh, he probably, of all of the Joint Chiefs, was the most committed to the war in Europe. And in fact, if you if you read uh, all of the history, uh, even at the time of Guadalcanal, uh, he was opposing having resources devoted to Guadalcanal. Nonetheless, he he approved the idea of the of the raid. Uh, and uh, the next slide will talk a little bit about that. But one of the things that he did was. Uh, he said, yeah, that's a good idea, but uh, you Navy guys are not going to get to fly the airplanes. We'll fly the airplanes. So, <laughs> little uh, inter-service rivalry there. Oh, that never happened. I, yeah. you know. <laughs> but the, uh, still yeah, the, uh, I guess the, the inspiration comes from, uh, from this man, uh, Captain uh, Francis Lowe. Yeah, Frank Lowe was, uh, was flying uh, in the, in the area of Norfolk, Virginia, and he's flying over an airfield that had a, a Navy carrier outline on it. And uh, there were some Army Air Corps bombers flying off of that airfield at the time. And that sort of gave him the idea that uh, it might be possible to fly bombers off an aircraft carrier. So uh, he, he took that idea back to uh, Ernest King and King thought enough of Lowe. So, uh, you know, that's, that's to, all to Lowe's credit uh, that he thought the idea was a good one. And he asked him to work with another one of his subordinates by the name of Donald Duncan to flesh out the idea and see what, what we could do with it. So this picture talks about uh, Duncan. Duncan uh, filled 30 pages of, of uh, legal pad with the idea of how are we going to do this? And unfortunately, uh, that doesn't exist anymore. And uh, it would really be, really add to our understanding of, of what was going on at the time if we had that 30 pages of legal notepad, but we don't. In any case, he and Lowe took that to uh, Hap Arnold at uh, King's request on January 17th. And basically the idea was approved with the exception of what I said earlier that Duncan's plan had Navy people flying the B-25 or at this point, they did not know what the aircraft was going to be, but the Navy flyers were going to be the ones that took off with the bombers. and. And Hap Arnold said, I'm sorry, Charlie, but you know, that's not going to happen. It's going to be U.S. Army, Army Air Force people that do that. Uh, Duncan's plan had three options in it. One of them was take, take uh, off with the bombers uh, three hours before dawn, about 400 miles from Tokyo. Uh, the idea being that Doolittle would lead the raid with incendiary bombs and the rest of the raiders as they were strung out across the Pacific coming toward uh, Tokyo would be able to see the fires that were lit and, and they would continue that. Option two was to take off at dawn. Oh, by the way, option one was not popular with the Navy because you'd have to light up a carrier at that point in time and make it uh, subject to submarine attacks and that kind of stuff. Option two was to take off at dawn and conduct uh, daylight bombing. That wasn't popular in some regards because that gave anti-aircraft and and uh, other assets a better opportunity to identify the bombers and, and uh, take action. And then the third option was to take off just before dark and bomb at night again, uh, do a little leading and uh, and that sort of thing. And then the the final thing was, if the uh, raid is is spotted before uh, the bombers could take off, if they were in range of Japan, they would take off immediately. If they were not in range of Japan, they would dump the B-25s over the side, bring up the Hornets uh, ship or uh, aircraft, and and do whatever fighting was necessary. So. 
that's kind of the way Duncan's plan was laid out and it was, it was accepted except for the idea that uh, the Army Air Force was gonna fly the bombers. So then Doolittle uh, is sort of picked for the job. Now Doolittle uh, was an interesting person for a whole lot of reasons, but one of them was uh, Doolittle actually had a doctorate in aeronautics, uh, which was a pretty rare bird in those days. So he understood a whole lot of things that most of the, uh, the people that flew aircraft uh, didn't know. Uh, so he was tasked with the idea of getting this thing going. And it, it had a, an extremely uh, tough date to meet. April 1st was the date that it was supposed to uh, start. And that was an almost impossible uh, deadline. It turns out that it was pretty well made, but it was almost impossible to do it. Um, secrecy, we think, was very tight. It says in the slide that FDR did not know any of the details of the plan. Again, conventional wisdom, we'll come back to that. Um, interestingly enough, Doolittle, despite all of his credentials, also wanted to fly the mission. And that wasn't really Hap Arnold's idea of how that was gonna take place. So um, Doolittle goes into Arnold and begs him to lead the mission and, and Hap says, okay, if you can get uh, Millard Harmon, the chief of staff to say, okay, then you can do it. So Doolittle being the smart person that he was, ran down the halls, got to the chief of staff's office and said, uh, uh, Millard uh, Hap says it's okay, I can lead this uh, flight if it's okay with you. And so uh, Harmon says, well, if it's okay with Hap, it's okay with me. So Doolittle walks out with, a, with the, uh, the, the mission and he hears uh, uh, Harmon on the intercom saying, but Hap, he told me you said you could, he, he could do, do it. So, you know, he, he beat the, uh, he beat the, uh, the 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 odds there by actually uh, knowing how how the bureaucracy in the Ar U.S. Army Air Force worked at the time. Well, and, and not just the armed forces, but it, it goes back to uh, family life. You know, if if mom says no, go ask dad. <laughs> it reminds me exactly of that. You know, go ask your father, and you know, poor old dad has to has to figure it out. Well, that was kind of Millard Harmon's uh, burden at that point. <laughs> so now that the uh, the Army Air Corps is uh, involved there's comes the uh, question of what kind of aircraft and uh, there were uh, quite a few discussions about what would be best but it kind of really came down to uh, two choices here yeah well uh, the first choice re actually were b24s or b26s but uh, doolittle eventually said no it has to be the b25 because it has the best characteristic so one of the things that uh, was a question at that point in time, could you take a B-25 off of an aircraft carrier um, without uh, destroying uh, either the aircraft or the carrier itself? And, uh, you know, just by comparison here, you can see the biggest thing that the Navy had at the time was the, was the TBF Avenger. And the, the wingspan of the, of the B-25 was 13 feet more than the biggest thing that the Navy had at that point in time. It was also almost twice as heavy as the, as the uh, heaviest thing that uh, we launched off of aircraft carriers. So it turns out that uh, if you, you use the B-25, they had about six inches, six feet of clearance, six inches would be a little bit bizarre, six feet of clearance on the the right wing tip and about four feet of clearance uh, on the, uh, the left wheel going off the flight deck. So they had to stay in a pretty straight line going off the flight deck against a, a, what turned out to be a pretty substantial wind at the time. But at least um, Doolittle had, had decided by the by, fairly shortly after he got the assignment that the B-25 was the logical thing to uh, to use in the raid. And that's, uh, you, you bring up a point that uh, I've not read or, or heard discussed before. And it's usually the, the wingspan and how much room there was between the between the edge of the deck and the and the uh, the conning tower but uh, also the uh, the weight that would have to be sustained by the uh, the carrier deck to be able to hold those air aircraft and their footprint in comparison to uh, what was in the, the navy inventory at the time yeah keep in mind that uh, aircraft carriers in the u.s at that time had basically wooden decks uh, so uh, for example uh, i'm not exactly sure what the configuration of CVH flight deck was, but the configuration of the later Essex class carriers was one inch of teak, two inches of Douglas fir, and then about a three quarter inch pan of steel below that. And so you had these rather heavy aircraft uh, being spotted along the deck that was uh, basically a wooden deck. And we, there's a lot of things we could talk about relative to the wooden decks or steel decks, but it's probably not appropriate for this discussion. 
But at any rate, that was certainly a consideration. It's a very heavy aircraft compared to anything the Navy flew at that time. Uh, we actually have a, a question came in from uh, one of our audience members. Uh, wasn't Admiral Nimitz or Admiral Halsey higher in the U.S. military hierarchy than Hap Arnold? So wouldn't they have maybe decided which pilots would fly? Um, well, nobody was higher than Hap Arnold in the in the U.S. Air Force. So he right. had the authority there. King was certainly uh, senior to everybody uh, in the military except George Marshall at that point in time. So presumably uh, Marshall could have had some uh, extra influence, but he wasn't really involved in that particular process because of the fact that the Army Air Force was the one that that needed to provide the aircraft. And Halsey wasn't in, wasn't involved until later. We'll talk about that. Nimitz wasn't in, wasn't even really aware of what was going on until much later in the process. And uh, some somewhere in the middle of March, uh, Donald Duncan actually went out to Pearl Harbor to tell Nimitz that this was what was going to happen. And uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of the slides, but we don't have to talk about all of them. But at any rate, uh, Nimitz was not pleased because he was looking forward to having the Hornet as part of a, a task force that would be four carriers basically ambushing the Japanese carriers at Coral Sea, which was what he was planning. Uh, he was told uh, you have to provide not only the Hornet to fly it to carry the B-25s, but you also have to provide the Enterprise as the support for that and, and the defense of, of that force as it's proceeding across the, the Pacific towards Japan. And he put Halsey in charge of, of, that, ta of that task force at that point in time. So he, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was not pleased. Uh, this slide talks about the fact that the Hornet uh, CB-8 was just finishing up its post-commissioning trials at that particular point in time. And so on, in, in February 1942, February 1st in particular, it was in Norfolk at Pier 7. And you can see in the picture that there are some wildcats, for example, on the, on the uh, uh, bow of the, of the flight deck there. Uh, People talk about the fact that the Doolittle Raid was the first time we'd ever launched Army uh, bombers off of a flight deck, and that's not true. They actually, if you go to the next slide, actually it talks about the, the two guys that actually flew uh, B-25s off of the off of the Hornet on February the 2nd, uh, 1942, a, a couple of lieutenants in the Army Air Force. There's also a picture of uh, Mark Mitchner down there on the lower left-hand side. Uh, Mark Mitchell was actually Naval Aviator number 33, so he was the 33rd person to get Navy wings at that point in time, so uh, almost uniquely qualified uh, to deal with uh, uh, this question. So Duncan talked to him, and, and Mitchell said, yeah, I think we could probably handle B-25s, and so that's how it got started, and they proved it by launching lightly loaded B-25s uh, on February the 2nd, and the next day, the uh, people that were uh, going to be involved in that were told to fly their B-25s uh, actually to Wold Chamberlain Field in Minneapolis where they started doing modifications of the B-25 according to the specs that, that Doodle set up for them. So it was all of this stuff was happening very fast and if you look back at history during this all this planning a lot of things were happening but none of them were really good as far as the United States is, is concerned with regard to the war in the Pacific. And, and uh, you know, we'd lost the Philippines, uh, we'd lost uh, what was called the Dutch East Indies at that point now, Indonesia. And so there was almost nothing that was going the, the way of the U.S. at that point, Guam, Guam excuse me. And uh, Wake had also been captured at that point in time. <clears throat> and. Uh... This uh, next slide kind of uh, talks about some of the uh, the limited strikes that that the U.S. was taking at that time to to try and do something on on the positive side, but uh, really these uh, these raids uh, had really no effect on the on the Japanese uh, forces at all, and and really wouldn't have the same uh, impact uh, at this point in the war that they will you know later on when the when the island hopping campaign starts. Yeah, both Yorktown and Enterprise made some strikes in the Marshall Islands at that and in, in this time frame. But uh, you know, as you said, not too much effect. Just to say, you know, we're still here. So um, this is a picture of, of you know a guy walking across the flight deck uh, on the Enterprise uh, during that raid. Uh, probably um, most famous for uh, 
the actions of uh, Bruno Guaido on the on the uh, flight deck of the of the uh, Enterprise at that time. So also going on a lot of other planning. Uh, first of all, they were trying to get the Russians to say that the planes could land in uh, in Russia, which would have meant they had to fly 600 miles less than they would have had to fly to the supposed airfields that were going to be available in in China. Uh, Stillwell, who was uh, uh, an American general that was assigned as Chiang Kai-shek's uh, chief of staff, uh, was in Washington at the time of all of this planning, was told about the raid, but not told very much about the details of the raid. So uh, he was supposed to get back to China and do some things about it. Um, but he didn't know anything really about the urgency. He didn't know Japan was going to be the target, as a matter of fact. And uh, Claire Chenault, at that point in time, was not a, 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 a U.S. officer, but was a head of the Flying Tigers in, in China, was assigned by Stillwell to, uh, you know, set up for gasoline for the bombers to move further into China and also get the airfields ready for their landing. None of that really happened, uh, as it turned out. Um, and there's, you know, you could probably have a full uh, hour of discussion of the the basic conflict between the way Stillwell think of, thought of things and the way Chenault thought of things. So we won't have to go into that, but that's another whole discussion. And and also uh, central to the to the mission itself was uh, the the original plan was to take off from the aircraft carrier and actually uh, transfer the the B twenty fives to uh, China. So it was it was, was lend, lend lease with a bombing mission in the in the middle. Obviously that, that didn't happen, but that was the original intent. That was that was the plan, and the, that was the reason they were supposed to take off about 400 miles from Tokyo because that would have allowed them, uh, with the modifications that they had made to the B-25s, to fly into fields in in China that were uh, in areas that not occupied by the Japanese at that point in time. So yeah, the Flying Tigers were supposed to get 16 B-25s. Which would have, you know, they, they they would have had the opportunity had they done that to actually bomb Japan with the V-25s for the, the, whatever period of time they would have lasted. So basically, what happened was that on February 3rd, they they started moving the uh, the aircraft to um, Old Chamberlain Field. Uh, they had modifications made. Then they went down to uh, uh, the south. They were supposed to go to Columbia, South Carolina. They did that. Then eventually, they ended up at Eglin. Uh, Air Force Base in uh, or Eglin Field, it was called at the time, uh, in uh, in Florida, and almost everybody that was involved in that, and as far as I know, in fact, everybody that was uh, was told about what their uh, mission was going to be, which was nothing more than an extremely dangerous mission, everybody volunteered to be part of that, which is sort of emblematic of the of the the mood of the United States at the time. They really wanted to get back at the sneak attack. So a guy by the name of Hank Miller, uh, who was a Navy lieutenant, who was actually training Navy pilots at, at um, Pensacola, uh, got orders to fly over to Eglin Field to uh, undertake a special mission. And he wasn't told very much about what that special mission was going to be. Interestingly enough, he was told to report to a colonel over there, an Air Force colonel. Uh, he walked in and said, "Here, I, I'm Hank Miller. I'm supposed to report to you, and I have a special mission." And the colonel didn't know what he was talking about. And as Miller was about to leave. He said something about Doolittle, and the the, the colonel, you know, basically uh, hushed him up, closed the door, and said, "Oh, now I know what you're supposed to be talking about." But uh, you know, so he was the guy that actually was set up to train the the uh, Air Force pilots to take up uh, take off in 450 feet instead of their usual 3,000. That was his mission. <clears throat> so off to Florida in this picture, you can see Hank Miller is the closest to the fuselage of the aircraft. They're talking to the uh, to the pilot. And the reason we know that's Hank Miller is because he's wearing khaki trousers instead of the, the trousers that are being worn by the Air Force. So we know that was Hank Miller at the time. <clears throat> and here he is walking away. So this is, uh, you know, on the left you can see, or maybe you can see because it's pretty well cluttered on this picture. One of the B-25s taking off at Eglin Field, and then the slide on the right, which the 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 red arrows have slipped from where they're supposed to be, but there are markings on the on the runways at uh, at Eglin Field with the markings for the B-25s to take off because again they were supposed to be able to take off in 
uh, 450 feet or less, uh, which was what they were practicing for the for basically for the uh, much of February and and March in in Eggland. I I I really enjoyed seeing this slide. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, it's taken from a notebook that uh, that Hank Miller kept, and uh, and this page shows that uh, his remarks about uh, Doolittle is trying to take off, and then a couple of other of the pilots there. Doolittle got more press than everybody else did, but you can see that he took off in his second uh, two recorded uh, takeoffs there in 350 feet and 360 feet. So uh, there's one on there that's uh, I think it's 300 is the lowest thing that we've seen. Uh, uh, from that, but Miller's basically was was teaching them how the Navy took off of aircraft carriers because in those days, for the most part, everything was deck launched. There were relatively few catapults used during World War II by comparison to the number of of planes that were taken taking off on what we call a deck launch. <clears throat> so uh, the the Hornet after the B twenty five launch. Uh, spent about another month in uh, on the East Coast and then they set off from Norfolk and, and came around uh, through the Panama Canal uh, to San Diego. Uh, and then on the way up to Alameda a little bit later on, they got to Alameda on March 31st. So the aircraft carrier was ready. Uh, there's a picture of, uh, of the Yorktown class carrier going through the Panama Canal. The Raiders also head west and that was that started on March 25th. Uh, the original number of B-25s was 24. 22 of them survived uh, in good enough shape to be flown to uh, actually to McClellan Field in Sacramento, California. And uh, they were they got some modifications there. One of the things that the, the McClellan Field was told specifically was don't mess with the carburetors on any of these engines because they've been set up to be as, as lean as possible. Uh, and uh, a lot of those orders were ignored by uh, McClellan Field, as it turned around, as it turned out, uh, and later reported by uh, Ski York uh, and documented by him. He's the one that actually flew his his B-25 to uh, to an area around Vladivostok in Russia, contrary to uh, all of the orders that that Doolittle issued, etc. Uh, Doolittle was not very happy with what happened at McClellan, and he was told he couldn't leave until he had signed all of the paperwork and uh, for the, uh, all of the changes that had been made, including propellers. And he uh, basically, after being harangued about it, wrote down one word on the the uh, paperwork, and that was lousy, and got in his airplane and left, basically. <clears throat> There's a, a one of our uh, viewers is, is was asking about uh, training that, that may have taken place in uh, in California. and Amazingly, we have a slide that talks just about that. Uh, well, they obviously trained at, at McClellan where they were still doing some modifications. They also, uh, and we have confirmed this since, that we also know that they did some flying out of a, out of a, a smaller uh, airport uh, in Willows, California. Uh, basically, uh, uh, the guy that uh, was known to do little because of uh, World War II flying and uh, and because they did hunting trips together, uh, he uh, ran the the uh, Willows flying service and uh, so do little and some of his uh, guys went down to Willows and and did practice takeoffs from the Willows airport. And then on March 31st, after all of that, we selected the best 16 bombers out of the out of the 22. Uh, based on their performance, and those were the 16 that then flew to NAS Alameda, and were the ones that were put aboard the the Hornet. Uh, that's a picture of uh, what what Alameda NAS looked like in 1942. Not much, as you can see. Uh, later, it was a much bigger, much more uh, complex um, facility, but not in 1942. So the 16 bombers basically landed at uh, NAS Alameda. Uh, they taxied uh, down uh, to the to Pier Two, taxied on to Pier Two, were were loaded onto the Hornet, uh, and the 22 crews. Uh, remember, there were 16 selected for the for the mission, but there were 22 bombers. The all 22 of the crews came aboard the Hornet, so they had six spare crews, as well as uh, the 16 bombers and the crews for those. So these are actually pictures that were that came out of the movie 30 Seconds Over Tokyo because we don't really have any pictures of uh, that particular thing happening. We do have this picture, 
which shows Pier 2 down at the bottom. You can see a B-25 uh, down in the lower, just, uh, just to the left of the center there, about to be loaded. And if you look at the forward part of the flight deck, you can see the bombers that had been loaded on there al already at that point in time. So this is Pier 2 in Alameda, which is about 100 yards uh, to the port side of uh, where the Hornet is located today. So we're uh, very close to uh, where that happened. And obviously, part of the uh, on at Pier 3 and what was the old Naval Air Station in Alameda closed down in 1995. So the, uh, the Raiders go to San Francisco for shore leave. Uh, Doolittle meets um, uh, Halsey and, and his uh, chief of staff, um, Miles Browning, in the in the hotel, and they go over the plan. and uh, And uh, he and his Doolittle and his wife spend the night in uh, of April first in San Francisco, while the Hornet is actually uh, has left the pier in Alameda and is now at, uh, anchored out in the bay in San Francisco. Uh, obviously, with 16 Army Air Corps bombers on our flight deck, which probably caused a lot of commotion uh, among the people in San Francisco. Doolittle comes back to the Hornet after on on April 2nd uh, by boat, and he's called back to the to to land, if you will, to take a call from General Marshall, which was essentially just saying good luck, Jimmy, and uh, that that sort of thing. But that's uh, kind of all that turned out. Well, it it is interesting. You mentioned you know seeing the the airplanes on the uh, on the on the deck of the carrier, and when you when you when you look at the sequence of events, the the uh, takeoffs that that took place um, on the on the east coast off uh, Virginia uh, Virginia Beach, uh, the training down in Florida, the training in in California, it, there were people who had ill intent in the United States and would could have fed this information to to our enemies. But I guess it's easy for us today to look back and go, oh, look at all you can connect all these dots. But at the time, it it was common practice to transport uh, some larger aircraft to forward uh, air bases using an aircraft carrier, not to fly them off, but to actually, as we do, did with the uh, the Hornets uh, 16 B-25s, crane them on, crane them off, and, and away they go. That's exactly that's exactly the case, and even the people on the crew of the Hornet, having loaded on 16 uh, bombers, assumed that they were going to take them to some base somewhere and 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 offload them. So, even uh, Mitcher, who was a captain of the of the Hornet, didn't know until April 1st when Duncan came to see him that he was going to take those bombers uh, to, to uh, within 400 miles of Japan and launch the bombers. Um, he of course already knew that you could do that with a B-25. So. Uh, it wasn't until the next day, actually, that uh, the crew knew about what was going on. And there's another slide in here that shows the the um, what we might call a vertical replenishment today, with a with a blimp uh, coming out of uh, of San, uh, out of uh, the the Bay Area, delivering uh, some extra parts to the to the Hornet when it was on its way, when it was already past the the fair uh, the Golden Gate. Uh, which was a, took place at about 1100. They went through the Golden Gate at that point in time, and so uh, once uh, L8 had dropped off the the the, the parts, uh, it left going back to Alameda. And at that point in time, then uh, Mitchell was free to tell the crew that they were going to take those 16 Army Air Corps bombers to Japan and uh, and actually bomb Japan. So. Uh, a lot of loud cheering occurred at that point in time, perhaps heard in San Francisco, but probably not. Well, and now we've, we have the, uh, the blended uh, crew on, on the Hornet. Uh, we have the, uh, the regular Navy crew and the Army Air Corps crew, and uh, uh, lots, of, lots of stories, I'm sure, uh, that, uh, that took place with the interactions and little inter-service rivalry. Well, and a lot of briefings going on because uh, there were, there were a lot of things that uh, they didn't know at that point in time. So one of the things that's interesting about uh, the Hornets uh, crew at that point in time is it included a guy by the name of Steve Jerica, who was both the flight deck officer and the air intelligence officer. And if you go to the next slide, it describes some of the things that, uh, I think it's the next slide, but uh, it, it describes Steve Jerica, but I'll tell you about him. He was, uh, he had, uh, Greg been a, uh, he was born in Los Angeles, but he lived in uh, um, he, he lived in uh, the Philippines for most of his young life, and he actually spoke uh, a number of languages because of the 
um, population of the Philippines at the time spoke Japanese, Philipp uh, Tagalog, uh, some Chinese and other uh, languages as well. He graduated from high school at age 14 after having been homeschooled up until the ninth grade. Uh, always wanted to go to the Naval Academy, uh, but was also uh, schooled in both China and Japan. And so he spoke Japanese very well. Uh, so he's the guy that was doing the briefing. And, and one of the things that Jerika did when he was uh, assigned as the Naval Air Attaché or the Assistant Naval Air Attaché in, in uh, Tokyo was on his own volition, he went around to everywhere in Japan that he could get to, and particularly the golf courses, which he got invited to because he played golf very well. And he recorded things like, where is the Mitsubishi factory? Where are the, uh, the uh, power plants? Where are other things that would have been targets? And nobody asked him to do it. It was just him thinking about, you know, what would happen if war broke out between the United States and Japan. Uh, and uh, so he was able to take the very non-descriptive maps that they had at the time and actually pinpoint uh, the targets for the for the raiders, including things like, well, in this case, you're going to see, see three smokestacks five miles before you get to the Mitsubishi factory or whatever, so that they had targeting kinds of capability just on the basis of the things that he had seen while he was going around Japan. So, uh, you know, you think, well, was it serendipitous that Jerika was on the Hornet at the time, or did somebody plan that? I don't actually know the answer to that, but it certainly was a good thing that Jerika was where he was at the time. <clears throat> and that, and his name is one that that I have not uh, had not heard before. But obviously, he uh, did have uh, quite an influential role in in the final stages of of the raid. Of all of the people on the Doolittle raid, there are a whole bunch of really interesting people: Nimitz, Halsey, uh, King, uh, all of the people we've talked about before. With the exception of Doolittle, he's the guy that I think is the most interesting character of the rest of them, just because of all the things he did. He ended up. Uh, in his naval career uh, during World War II, he was the navigator on the Franklin when it was uh, kamikaze, won a Navy Cross for uh, his actions at that point in time, uh, ended up being the commanding officer of NROTC at, at Stanford, got himself a PhD while he was at Stanford, taught uh, political science for a number of years. His brother-in-law was, was one of the main guerrilla forces in the Philippines for a long time. So there, if you read his oral history, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. His mother was executed as a spy by the Japanese in the Philippines. And so the Jerika family really contributed a, a great deal to the, to the war effort and you know, really interesting character. So look up Steve Jerika if you have a chance and uh, you know, if you can find his, his uh, oral history, which is at the Hoover Institute in, uh, at Stanford, uh, really interesting stuff. Well, and it, along with these uh, briefings, uh, there was a lot of a lot of downtime as well. And uh, when we talked to uh, John yes. Doolittle a couple of weeks ago, uh, the the, uh, the the gambling came up. And uh, to her recollection, she believes that uh, the Navy uh, did better uh, getting the uh, Air Corps' money than the Air Corps did with the Navy. But uh, the Navy guys have a different story. So, well, you know, uh, I don't know whether John is right or not. Uh, She's, she certainly is right about a lot of the things she wrote in her book, and it's really a fascinating book. Well, she's, she's done more than one now, but I'm thinking of Calculated Risk, for example. Um, I think, based on the evidence that I've read from various things, that probably the Army Air Force came out better than the Navy people. So certainly, there was an awful lot of things that were purchased in the ship store by the, uh, the Air Force officers that would represent a lot of, uh, a lot of earnings on their part. You know, in that uh, one more thing about, you know, who won what money or whatever. One of the really interesting things to me is, remember we, we talked about the fact that there were 16 planes and there were 22 crews. This is a suicide mission we're talking about for all intents and purposes, or at least you could look at it like that. And that, that was really the likely outcome of it. Those guys that won uh, money at poker or craps or whatever they were playing at the time actually would pay big money if they were part of the six crews that were not flying to be a part of the six, the 16 that were. So there were people who were offering big bucks to somebody to take their place on the raid. And, you know, that's the kind of mentality that, it, you know, it's almost un, not understandable in our current environment, but that was the way things were in 1942. So you can imagine guys trying to pay to get on a suicide mission. That's just, that's mind boggling to me. Yes. <laughs> 
one of the things that uh, Jerika and Doolittle both emphasized in their uh, in their briefings was not to uh, bomb the Imperial Palace. Do not bomb this. That was uh, that was um, among the admonitions that were delivered a lot of times by both of those people. Uh, Doolittle also delivered the admonition to not fly to Russia a number of times. So uh, the one plane that did go there, uh, you can speculate a lot, and it would be really interesting to know, and we don't. Uh, did uh, Ski York have orders from someplace else that he should take his plane to Russia to see what would happen? Uh, there's considerable speculation that the, that might have occurred. I don't actually believe it because he was the one that discovered his carburetors had been changed at McClellan and, and they were so they were richer than they should have been for the raid. So he ran out of gas a lot sooner than he might have otherwise. And I think that was the main reason. But there are a lot of people who believe that, uh, you know, Ski York had some secret mission that he was on. And, and there's uh, even this co-pilot uh, sort of emphasize that, that that possibility in some of his interviews. So we don't really know at this point in time. And uh, two of the crew members uh, spoke Russian, correct? That, that, there, there was that uh, unusual aspect of it, yeah, yeah that uh, just in that crew, which was a made up crew. It was not one of the crews that actually had been trained at, at Eglin. Uh, Ski York had never taken a B-25 off before he took the, his, his plane off the Hornet. Uh, so. You know that adds to the mystery. Did, was that was that deliberate? Did they you know make this crew up because a couple of them could uh, speak Russian and somebody had gotten to Ski York and said, "Would you be willing to?" I you know, all speculation, but it makes it more interesting in a lot of ways. It certainly does, and and good uh, coffee table debate. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, at maintenance uh, was uh, a part of the uh, a part of the daily uh, grind on the on the uh, aircraft carrier, to just keeping those uh, B-25s uh, in top uh, top condition with all the uh, uh, sea salt and spray and everything else that was going on. Yeah, they obviously they couldn't be taken down to the hangar deck, so they had right. to be on the flight their entire period of time. So they were subject to all the weather and that sort of thing. But the other thing that is even more interesting to me is that. Periodically, using the, the forward elevator on the Hornet, they brought up aircraft that were on the hangar deck and, and did uh, things like test their engines and that sort of thing. So the Navy aircraft were also uh, trying to get some maintenance at the same time. But a lot of things were going on with the, with the B-25s too. And in fact, uh, there were a considerable number of repairs done on the Hornet itself to some of the B-25s. One of them uh, lost a blower, for example, and they had to, they had to replace that in the uh, with the, the, the Navy crews doing uh, engine repair. So you probably, everybody has probably seen pictures of, uh, of you know, that Doolittle and Mitch are in the foreground of the picture on the upper left and then Doolittle's plane sitting on the forward part of the flight deck. Uh, some of the uh, B-25s in the lower left, uh, the one is getting ready to take off. And then you can see in the lower right-hand corner uh, this one, the lower right-hand corner, always uh, sort of a, gets my attention because the destroyer Gwen, you can see, is very close to the carrier. And if I was the officer of the deck on the on the Hornet, I would have been a little bit panicked about what in the world is that guy doing at that particular position. So it's it's nice that they had a plane guard destroyer behind them. That's one of the standard operations of of this kind of thing back in the day. Uh, when we didn't have helicopters as an alternative, uh, but that the destroyer is way too close to be in the plane guard position. So I'm not sure what he was doing, but it, it makes for an interesting picture. You can also see in the background there's a, behind it, there's a cruiser that was on the on the raid. And by the way, not only did we have 16 Army Air Corps bombers, we also had 16 ships in the in the task force. So there were an equal number of ships to the aircraft that we had on board. Well, and everything is kind of proceeding on on course and on time until uh, run across one of the Japanese picket ships. They, they spotted one uh, on at about 310 in the morning. They, they changed course and they dodged that particular one. Uh, they came back to their uh, standard course, uh, which was basically due west. And uh, they lost the first uh, picket uh, that they saw. That is, they, they uh, went around him, so it wasn't reported. Uh, it wasn't a, an issue of them reporting or anything. Uh, and then at five o'clock, about they launched air patrols, and, and they uh, they spotted another uh, picket at about seven o'clock. So in the next slide, it talks about uh, spotting the uh, 
the tw number 23 Nido Maru, which was essentially a fishing boat, but the Japanese had deployed a lot of fishing boats out there uh, off of Japan with uh, radios that they could um, report what they saw. And in this case, it was so close that there was no, no question about whether they had been spotted or not. Uh, and uh, this talks about the, the Japanese, uh, actually the, the, the Japanese radio men uh, sent a message to the Japanese Fifth Fleet that there were three carriers sighted at uh, 650 miles from in, in Nuvo Saki, which is the westernmost point of, or the easternmost point, I'm sorry, of Japan. Uh, so the Fifth Fleet um, took no particular action, feeling that, uh, you know, that wasn't a big threat. Um, the combined fleet sent a message out that, uh, you know, we should use tactical method number three against the United States fleet. And so some ships left uh, both Yokosuka and, and Hiroshima to uh, pursue that. Uh, and allegedly, and I don't even believe this, but allegedly uh, Nogumo and his carriers, which were down in the area of what was called Ceylon in, in that day and Sri Lanka today, uh, started uh, towards the position of the, of the American carriers. That, that would have, to me, would have been folly, and I don't think Nagumo was that dumb. Uh, they, could, they could never have gotten there, even close, but that's, that's the, the, the standard wisdom of the day. But from the Japanese standpoint, the carriers were too far away from Japan to be a real threat at that point in time because they assumed that carrier planes could not uh, fly a mission that long, and so they were thinking that they'd have to get something like 200 miles from Japan before they were a real threat. So, uh, by the way, there in the, in the top bullet, it talks about uh, the Nashville uh, firing 928 rounds of six, six inch shells at the Nido Maru. Keep in mind that there were at least 30 foot seas at the time. So the Nido Maru would have been going up and down like this. So there'd be waves and they'd be shooting and then he'd be down in the trough and so on and so forth. And so it's not a mystery that the, the uh, the Nashville would have had a hard time hitting it, but 900 or 915 shells actually fired at it, and then 13 more to clear the guns was a, was an amazing uh, use of ammunition. The captain apologized profusely for that. I've always wondered why they didn't decide to ram, Chuck. This <laughs> was so hard to shoot it, just ram it, right? That that would have been an you know something that a that a cruiser could have done probably without any particular damage yeah right uh, at any rate uh, you know once we've we've cited that it, then at uh, at zero eight hundred uh, Halsey uh, radios to get the uh, the bombers off with the launch planes and to, to Colonel Doolittle um, you know Godspeed and good luck this shows you what the plan was so you can see about in the middle of the slide. Uh, that's where they were at the time. They really wanted to be much closer than that, um, but you know they had to they had to do what the plan called for, and that was take off and and uh, fly to Japan. You don't have a very good picture here of the of the uh, the, the coast of, of of China, but it's pretty much where that last red arrow is, where they ran out of gas. You can see the coast of China. They were supposed to be a lot further inland than that. Uh, where the uh, Chinese airfields were allegedly supposed to be able to take care of them. So that sort of gives you an overall picture of of what the plan was and what the actual uh, mission was. And you, this slide uh, documents some of the uh, different uh, targets that uh, were assigned to the uh, to the bombers. And they were they were all industrial or military targets. Uh, some uh, bombs went off uh, and, and hit things that they weren't supposed to, as this happens in almost all bombing missions, but all of the targets were pretty much laid out by the, the, the uh, things that Jerika did with the, with the pilots on the, on the Hornet, giving them the targets that, uh, that he had um, figured out from his travels. There's the, uh, the first plane going off, that's Doolittle. Um, you know, some of this is, uh, um, some of the things that were, talked about um, you know, flying off and, and having a hard time getting off the deck. They didn't have a hard time getting off the deck. There was basically 60 knots of wind coming down the flight deck and they were almost in the air when they, when they started, uh, but they still had to worry about uh, the right wing hitting the island or the, the left uh, wheel going off the flight deck. And uh, so that was a real issue. One of the planes, actually the one that was flown by, uh, Ted uh, Lawson uh, forgot to put his flaps up or down 
he had actually done the test of putting his flaps down because, but because of the 60 knot wind and the, all of the planes in front of him with their engines going full blast, it was being a lot of buffeting was going on with his plane. So he brought his his uh, flaps back in and then forgot to lower them again when he was actually set for takeoff. And so he's the one that went down and and uh, finally came up. We don't have very many. I, I think that's that's I think that's where that that whole idea of it of it being very difficult to take off of the carrier, not to minimize the difficulty that it was, but yeah. in the conditions and knowing the B twenty five's performance with that much wind across the deck, uh, yeah. But it, it, that's just a very famous scene where you see it leave the aircraft carrier and then sink way down and then come back up. But, yeah. The biggest problem was for the flight deck officer, the launch officer, to determine when the appropriate time was to to release them from. Uh, to take off because the, the the bow of the carrier was doing the same thing, and so he had to get it get them to the point where they were taking off at the upswing of the bow, so they didn't make a submarine out of them. They they made an airplane out of them, so he got the additional boost of the of the bow coming up. Uh, the targets are shown on there: uh, Tokyo, uh, Kobe, uh, Nagoya, uh, um, Osaka, Yokosuka, uh, and so on and uh you know they pretty well did a, a, a good job of hitting those targets so uh, most of them hit their primary targets as a matter of fact um and uh you know were fairly successful as i said earlier there a few bombs went off target but relatively few uh civilian deaths were documented as a result of the Doolittle raid although the japanese obviously in the propaganda said that they bombed hospitals and schools and things like that which wasn't the intent at all and they certainly didn't bomb the Imperial Palace. That's right. And in this slide, you you mentioned the one of the previous slides that you didn't have a good uh, view of the the coast of China. You can see, you can see it much better here. Uh, that that really is a, a long stretch of uh, of open water to get from uh, the mainland of Japan to China. And you can see up in the uh, you know you see the Russian Federation up there, so you can see how much closer it was to get to. Uh, um, Vladivostok than it was to get to the inland of China. Yeah, and of course Korea wasn't there. It was all Korea at the time, or right. Manchuria, or you know uh, that sort of thing. So yeah. things have changed in terms of the maps of the world too. <clears throat> well, it, you know the 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 aftermath of the raid is 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 pretty well documented. That you know the the actual material damage was not that great, but the morale boost and the uh, change in tactics that that came uh, with the uh, the Japanese Navy repositioning uh, some of their their assets really was um, part of of what helped make uh, the the Battle of Midway a success uh, but uh, after the uh, after the the airplanes were launched uh, something that's not talked about that much is what happened to the task force uh, after after the airplanes were gone well interestingly enough the uh, 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 included in the task force were a, a, a number of destroyers and there were actually two oilers involved as well. So, uh, you know, one of the things that was true in that day and, and to some extent is still true is that destroyers had a relatively small capacity for uh, carrying the, the, the uh, black oil that, that powered them. So Halsey uh, had basically sent the oilers and the, and the destroyers on their way and then pers uh, pursued uh, the the rest of the trip with just the cruisers and the carriers because they could all maintain uh, pretty much the same speed. And uh, after the launch, uh, some people portrayed it later as Halsey was trying to, uh, you know, escape the Japanese uh, uh, reprisal attack. And the reality is, we talked about this earlier, Halsey knew about the Coral Sea campaign and he wanted to get uh, the two carriers back to be part of that. It turned out he didn't make it, but that was that was the reason he headed back to Pearl Harbor at 25 knots. But, um, you know, if you, you mentioned the, the impact of, of, of the raid itself, not a whole lot of real substantial damage by the, the aircraft, even though they hit their, their targets pretty much. But uh, some of the things that happened afterwards were that um, uh, the, the Japanese actually brought uh, four squadrons of aircraft back from the Central Pacific into the home islands to prevent something like this from happening again. So if you can think about the potential for four squadrons to be forward deployed instead of back in the home islands, that's, that was a significant thing at the time. Uh, maybe the biggest thing for the Japanese was the loss of face that occurred because both the Army and, and Tojo and, the, and 
the Navy had told the emperor there was no possibility of anything happening on the home islands. And of course that was proved to be false. Uh, the other thing that I think happened is that uh, because, uh, well, first of all, Yamamoto himself was, you know, for about three days, he was out of, he was out of action because he was just uh, astonished and, and humilified, humiliated by uh, the raid itself. And so finally he got back into action. And I think they, uh, they accelerated the, the plan for the attack on Midway and, and, and actually believed that uh, Yamamoto got his way to attack Midway, which wasn't popular with the Central Command at all, uh, but they accelerated that. They, they didn't uh, pay any attention to the things that they were wargaming about what could possibly happen with the raid on, the, on Midway. And so what they dis dismissed was exactly what happened to them. They got ambushed by the, by the three carriers at, at Midway. A home front morale went, went way up. They sold a whole lot more war bonds in the next uh, few months. Uh, the, the people that volunteered for the military went way up. So there's a hockey stick effect uh, of, the, of the raid itself in terms of what the home front. And the other thing that happened was the Japanese had been really expansionist to that point in time. And so this raid sort of said, well, wait a minute, maybe we ought to just consolidate where we are and not try to expand anymore. Uh, than we have, and that was particularly popular with the with the Japanese army at that point in time. Navy was more expansionist than the, than the army was, uh, so uh, that was another aspect of it. And then, of course, uh, when FDR was asked where the where the bombers came from, he he, he referred to uh, the book Lost Horizon and said they had come from Shangri La, and so the legend of Shangri La was born and. Actually, we actually uh, named a carrier Shangri-La after that. Uh, another Essex-class carrier was named Shangri-La for, for Roosevelt's little lie about that um, and a press conference. And, and uh, we should also uh, point out the, uh, the the steep toll that the uh, the Chinese uh, played oh, uh, paid yeah. for uh, their participation uh, in in the uh, in the raid. Yeah, the the Chinese really paid a high price for that. Uh, the, the, the estimate is that uh, some 250,000 Chinese were uh, butchered by the Japanese as a result of, uh, of that raid. And the Japanese also expanded uh, in China because they wanted to make sure that they got enough territory so no bombers could take off from China and actually reach Japan. So a lot of things uh, uh, were really bad for the Chinese as a result of the raid still. It's interesting to me uh, when we get people from China on board the Hornet today, Doolittle is one of the things they celebrate because that was the first strike against the Japanese uh, that, that occurred in World War II. And, and it's still a pretty famous thing that uh, for the Chinese of, of today's world. So they Chinese uh, on, on average may know more about the Doolittle Raid than the average American knows about the Doolittle Raid because it's so celebrated by the Chinese. So we get asked about if, get a, a group of people from China, you could ask about the Doolittle Raid almost without exception. Amazing. We've got uh, uh, quite a few uh, questions that have, that have come in during the uh, during the show, and we've, I know we've got, we've probably cleared a couple of them in the in the presentation. Um, uh, let's see, here's one. Was it ever discussed to have the naval aviators fly the uh, PBJ, the Navy version of the B-25? Um, in 1942, if my memory serves correct, the PBJ was not uh, part of the Navy or Marine Corps inventory. These were uh, B-25 uh, B models that were that were flown from yeah. the from the Hornet. And there were later models of the, yep. of the of the B-25, the D model, for example. You see quite often. Uh, no, as far as I know, uh, there was never any discussion of that. Um, uh, and a good question about the B-25 that uh, went to Russia, and of course we, we talked about the the uh, controversy or the uh, mystery that survives, surrounds that. Uh, but uh, the uh, the Russians never gave back that airplane, did they? No, they never did. And uh, one of the things that we have a we have a docent uh, on the Hornet who has pursued that uh, uh, relentlessly for a number of years, way before he was a docent on the Hornet, trying to find out what happened to that aircraft. Uh, we, we were particularly interested in, there were 38 photographs taken by that aircraft on its bombing mission. We would love to be able to see what those photographs look like, but uh, they're probably in some uh, archive somewhere in Russia and we, and we have never found them, even though 
Uh, this guy actually wrote to Putin uh, some years ago and said he'd like to know what would happen to all of that and got response. Uh, but uh, you know, some somewhere in the archives of, uh, of of the Russian Federation is probably some documentation about that, but we haven't been successful in getting it. But th it was an interesting mystery, and uh, a lot has been written about that. A lot of it not very well informed, but a lot of stuff has has been talked about in that. Um, Henry Kyle, one of our uh, viewers tonight, uh, just for for our uh, education, Seven Toed Pete was the card game that was uh, most played between the Army and Navy personnel. Yeah, and I don't know how to play Seven Toed Pete, and I never learned how to play AC Ducey either when I was on the on the Yorktown. <laughs> uh, in your opinion, uh, this is a question for actually for both of you, but uh, how historically accurate is uh, Thirty Seconds Over Tokyo? I mean, the, the book was written by Ted Lawson, who obviously had, had first-hand knowledge of everything that went on, but sometimes Hollywood it spices up a, a, a story for the audience. Uh, but in your opinion, uh, what's what's the historical accuracy of that? Uh, it, I think uh, particularly for the time frame, it was uh, pretty historically accurate. Obviously, the um, it was it came out during the war, and so there were uh, things in it that were uh, not completely accurate, but you know embellished uh, uh, our activity and, and um, were, were detrimental to what actually the Japanese did. But you know that that's pretty hard to say, given they they killed 250,000 people in China as a result of it. But yeah, reasonably accurate. Um, you know, let me let me give you this frame of reference. I was the uh, uh, aircraft carrier advisor for the 2019 movie Midway, and one of the things that we tried to do in that movie was to be as historically accurate as we could possibly be, given that we were making a movie. Okay, so there were any number of times that I said to the director, "Well, we really ought to do it this way," and most of the time, I have to say, he did it the way. But there were occasions when he said, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And so we decided at some point in time that the T-shirt for the movie ought to say, Chuck, it's a movie. <laughs> so while it is historically accurate, uh, you know, they have to make it entertaining as well. And so there were some things that, you know, you just you just couldn't do. And that happened in spades in the in the time frame that, that 60 Seconds Over Tokyo was filmed, but basically pretty accurate. <clears throat> Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is that any movie that is put out during World War II has a secondary purpose, right? So right. a sort of a po positive propaganda film. So of course they're going to embellish things that's going to make, you know, the, the the everything seem more heroic, more amazing, and and that's fair, that's normal. You're you're trying to sell war bonds, you're you're trying to win a war, so it certainly makes a lot of sense. So any creative license, is, I think, totally understandable. Yep. And, and one of the things they didn't have in 60 Seconds Over Tokyo that they should have had was that there was actually a billiards table on the Hornet, if you can believe that. So a ship that's <laughs> doing this and this at a billiards table makes a great craps table in, in any case. So, you know, that's that's one of the things that we, we can talk about as far as accuracy is concerned. <laughs> Well, you're with the uh, you're there on the on the uh, on the Hornet, um, and that obviously that great ship was uh, saved from the from the scrapper's torch. Um, in retrospect, uh, uh, one of our viewers was wondering why, uh, in your opinion, the uh, American public didn't step up to uh, save the Enterprise, uh, often cited as the most well, decorated ship yeah. in, in World War II. Completely tragic. Um, yeah, I I don't know. It was attempted. Uh, it was actually scrapped in '58, but uh, and it, there was a, a group formed to actually uh, save it. I'll, I'll tell you an interesting sidelight about that. Some, uh, in conjunction with the with the uh, movie Midway, we did a special uh, event at the Yonville Veterans Home here in California, and the guy. Uh, there were three people that were on the panel: myself, the guy that was the production designer, and the guy that wrote the script, and me. But what was most intimidating was that the moderator was a retired four-star admiral who had been the vice uh, chief of the Joint Chiefs, um, so vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, a really nice uh, guy, Admiral Winnefield. He told me, he was actually the, the commanding officer of the uh, second enterprise, so the nuclear ship enterprise. And he said, I, I'm going to tell you a secret story. He said, we took the uh, portholes for the captain's in-port cabin from CV-6, and we put them on CVN-65. And he said, guess what? 
CVN80 is going to be called the Enterprise, and we're going to take those same portholes and we're going to put them on the new uh, a Ford class carrier. So parts of the Enterprise have actually been saved, and they will be on the on the Enterprise that comes out. Well, it's being built right now at Newport News. So I'm not sure what the exact uh, launch date is supposed to be, but they will have the the portholes from the captain's inboard cabin on it. Excellent. Um, just before we uh, wrap up this evening, we're uh, a little over time, not too bad. Uh, so thanks for hanging in with us. Uh, but uh, Russ, you want to tell us a little bit about the uh, about what people would see when they, they come out to uh, to see the Hornet? Sure. The only thing I would add on the Enterprise story is anytime you do a poll, what's the top 10 ships that should have been saved and turned into a museum? Enterprise is always at the top. I mean, uh, there's yeah. just no question. Uh, but yeah, if you come to the Hornet Museum, I mean, one of the things that we pride ourselves on is that we've really kept the Hornet faithful to the way it looked when it was in service. And so we haven't changed as much as, you know, a lot of other uh, places tend to do. Um, so you, the, the hangar bay is open. We've got a ton of aircraft from World War II all the way up through the Vietnam era and a little bit later. We've got a lot of the below decks rooms open. The second deck has a lot of exhibits. You can get down to the third deck. Uh, you can see some of the rooms that you don't always think of, things like the barber shop. You can see the cobbler, uh, the, the sick bay is down there. Um, you can make your way all the way down to the engine room and the fire room, which is one of my favorite tours. Uh, the island uh, has a lot of great stuff that you can see in it. And what's great about the Hornet <clears throat> is the restoration guys, all volunteers, by the way, are constantly doing more work. So every six months or a year or so, another room, it gets opened and other aircraft gets repainted. Um, and so there's, if, even if you've been there before, uh, <clears throat> within the last couple of years, there's probably something you can see there now that wasn't there before. So I highly recommend coming to visit. And, and if you've been there, come back because you'll, you'll, you'll see something and you'll enjoy it. And if uh, folks would like to visit your uh, website, what's the, uh, what's the address? So it's uh, uss-hornet.org. Excellent. Now, uh, and don't forget the dash. <laughs> yeah, the dash, everybody forgets the dash. USS-Hornet.org. There you go. Uh, in, in, I, and I don't think we've mentioned this. The uh, the the Hornet that took the the B-25s on the Tokyo raid uh, was, as we, we mentioned earlier, was a relatively brand new uh, aircraft carrier, uh, but did not uh, survive uh, 1942. It was uh, it was sunk in which uh, in October. October. Yep. yep. October. Almost exactly a year after it was commissioned. Right. At the and, Battle of the Sea. Islands. Yep, and the there was uh, another aircraft carrier already uh, being built, and um, it was uh, it's supposed to have a different name, but they renamed it the the uh, Hornet, which is the uh, the ship that you have there in, in Alameda. Yeah, it was going to be the Kearsarge, and that that happened four times. So the Yorktown was sunk, the right. Wasp was sunk, Lexington was sunk, and and the Hornet was sunk, and so we named uh, four Essex class carriers for those ships, and so. Japanese thought they sunk one and they got another one. It's got the same name, only it's bigger, <laughs> uh, faster, has more aircraft and is more powerful and so on and so forth. So uh, and, the idea was in those days, aircraft carriers were named either after battles like Yorktown, the Battle of Yorktown or previous uh, ships. And so this is actually the eighth Hornet, first one being in 1775. So it goes back a long ways. And uh, this particular ship has a, a storied history uh, in it in itself, including, uh, I believe it's uh, five recovery missions from the uh, from uh, NASA's space program. Well, it has it has a number of them, but the most important ones are Apollo 11 and 12. So the first yeah. four men that worked on the moon were the uh, also uh, took their first solid steps, if you will, on the hangar deck of the of the Hornet. All right. Well, and if we, you uh, go ahead, uh, we we also have, and this is sort of uh, contemporaneously interesting, as we have a mobile quarantine facility that they were isolated in on the first three missions, supposed to be four missions, but the first three missions to the moon because we didn't know whether there were pathogens on the moon. And so we have a mobile quarantine facility, so, and which is, you know, interesting in the, in the time of COVID, if you will. Yes. <laughs> well, it, again, if you uh, are out in uh, 
the Alameda area, and please uh, make sure you drop by and, and uh, see this historic ship and the, the legacy that uh, they preserve there with the uh, Sea, Air, and Space Museum of the USS Hornet. And if you'd like to see a B-25 in action, the uh, Commemorative Air Force has quite a few B-25s uh, scattered around the country. Uh, if you just go to our website, commemorativeairforce.org, you can track where those airplanes are, uh, where they're housed, and also some of the air shows and events that they'll be at uh, throughout the uh, spring, summer, and uh, fall season. So you get to see the uh, aircraft carrier and the uh, B-25s that flew off the, uh, the Hornet. So that is going to do it for uh, tonight's uh, show. Thank you for uh, for joining us and sticking with us a little over time. But if you would, please click that like, subscribe, or follow button so we can let you know about any of our future shows. And if you have any ideas for a topic you'd like us to uh, cover, send Leah Block an email at media at cafhq.org. And uh, Chuck and Russ from the USS Hornet Sea, Air, and Space Museum, thanks for being our guest tonight. And uh, wish you a wonderful evening along with all of our audience. And until next time, for the Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Buss. Have a good night. Thanks, Thank Steve. You.